Okay, welcome everyone to uh, quality improvement methods. And today we will continue with the improved phase of the make and Six Sigma methodology. Um, we have talked previously in the five major uh, phases about some of the tools, along with the review of the, the make framework and we covered all other tools. Today, when we talk about the analyze phase, we will focus on um, other tools that we have not covered previously in the review. Uh, we will start with one of the new tool that uh, for the analyze, which is the interrelationship diagram, or they call it ID, stands for um, interrelation and the, uh, the D for the diagram. Um, when we use it and how we use it and um, how it is relevant to the previous phases. The interrelation diagram, uh, it, it works closely with the cause and effect diagram. As the Pareto, we have seen it in the major phase when we collect the information and prioritize the causes and start to link them with the effect. Here in the analyze phase, after you have done all that, and you would like to investigate and analyze the cause and effect, uh, but you don't have the number of frequency like um, in the Pareto uh, chart we have done it, you can use the interrelation diagram. So you can analyze the cause and effect and study the relation between them. Um, also, if you have done the Pareto, it helps you if you have more than one uh, criteria that you are going to work on. So you can also use the interrelation diagram to investigate about multiple um, causes that uh, how is the relation between them, uh, identify um, the causes and effect among all the critical issues in the process. So usually after you've done the uh, fishbone diagram or the cause and effect diagram, you come up with this list of causes and the effect, and then you start in the analyze phase, investigate them using this tool. The cause and effect just demonstrate the relationship linearly with the, uh, the, the, the relationship between the causes and the, the effect without consideration how the differences between the causes, the causes in terms of how strong they are related to the effect, how strong they are related to each other. So that is about the um, uh, cause, uh, the interrelation diagram. Um, usually, as we said, it works for examining the causes and effect after this record in the fishbone diagram. Uh, how it looks is very simple. After you list all the causes, uh, and effects uh, or the issues related to the problem in the measure phase. Then you come in the analyze phase and you put them in this tool, which is very simple. You list all the issues related to your uh, problem. And this example, consider five key issues to improve customer service. So the customer service uh, uh, was the case study where they needed to improve it they have investigated what was um, the problem in the customer service. They found many key factors or key issues related to that one. Um, for example, um, customer satisfaction was low, uh, education and training uh, is needed. All that is already done in the major phase. But how I can prioritize them, and I don't have, as we said, maybe um, um, enough data or information so I can um, uh, judge or make the decision. You can put these key factors or key issues and list them in this matrix. It's very simple matrix, and it can in uh, you can increase it as factors you have. It doesn't have to be um, with a, a certain number. There is no limited number for that uh, tool. Um, for example, here they have identified the five key issues for uh, improving customer service as logistic support, customer satisfaction, education and training, personal incentives, and leadership. So they list them horizontally 
and they list them the same order vertically, then you eliminate the diagonal or you just um, um, color the diagonal because you are not going to use it. And then you study each two issue or each two key factor together and see how is the relation between them. So in this case, for example, the support, uh, logistic support and the customer satisfaction, you study how strong the relationship between them. And when you identify the strength of the relationship between the two factors, you can use this key uh, shapes, the circle shape, that means the relationship between these two factors is very significant or strong. The rectangular, that means it is medium. And then we have the triangle that shows it is weak or low relationship between these two factors. So you're using the shapes or you use um, the weight of that shape, it is up to you. Um, this is, it's based on your preference. Also the scale, also it is up to you how you scale them, whether three or you can put five here and then three here and zero or one. This is how you would like to do it. Uh, but this is the concept of studying every two factors or two key issues together and try to investigate and analyze it based on the relationship. So between the logistic support and the customer satisfaction, obviously there is a significant uh, relationship between them um, where we can see the customer satisfaction and the personnel incentive also again has a significant uh, relationship. And if you think about it, if the personnel that is working in the um, uh, customer service, if he is not get, having enough incentives or um, um, pack, salary packages, that would reflect how he will handle um, the customer service and uh, eventually the customer satisfaction, it will be also affected. If we look to um, another um, uh, or low or weak relationship, we can see the personal incentives and the logistic supports that considered to be low. But if you look to the logistic support and the leadership, it has a medium, that means it is also considered to be, um, um, uh, there is a, a, a moderate relationship between the leadership and support. So you have to do this study for every factor across all the other factors and identify for every factor what is the relationship and you can place the shape that represent the strength of that relationship. As you can see, the customer satisfaction with the logistic support, with the education, uh, the education and training with the logistic support, and then the personnel incentives and the leadership. So with are you completing this row, then you can add up the total points or the total uh, uh, marks for this relationship for that specific factor horizontally. So you add three plus two plus one plus two, and then you get eight as a total for the logistic support. You apply that to the whole other key factors going vertically here in the table or in the matrix and then you add them all up horizontally and get the total for every single key factor then you can tell later what are the most significant uh, uh, factors and needs to be um, um, improved first or prioritized first so here in our case customer satisfaction and leadership are the two most critical issues need to pay, uh, to pay your attention on and you have to focus on in your improved phase. So this is one of the tools that is uh, very handy to use. Even if you don't have enough data, you can um, just refer on a meeting with your stakeholders or the organization, administration, 
to evaluate those causes and effects, you have found them in the major phase, and you can come up with this uh, tool and implement it to identify um, which is the more significant and where you need to focus on the next step. Uh, moving on, on the analyze phase, uh, with the same concept of the interrelationship um, uh, diagram, there is the force field analysis diagram. And intentionally, I put them in this order because they follow the same concept. Uh, the, the difference here, when you come up here with the, the one um, um, objective or one um, uh, target or focus, for the improved phase, before you take it to the improved plan and you start implement your improved plan and you try to improve it, you use this tool and it's very useful. It gives you a broad view about your uh, uh, problem and also you look to both sides of your problem. You look for the constraints, the obstacles before you proceed and, uh, and improve it. For example, just let's go quickly here. Um, considering this example here, if you uh, decided to focus on the customer satisfaction and leadership, let's say the leadership, you, you, you have just thought in your mind that you are going to change the leadership or um, you are going uh, to restructure the company, um, a heretical uh, um, 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 order, um, or you are going to implement a new system uh, for evaluating customer satisfaction. If you have come to this level about the decision to make that step for the changes, this tool will help you to look at that from the both sides, from the plus sides and the minus sides. For any solution or for any changes or improvement, you have to evaluate both sides because sometimes and most of the times changes will draw some constraints and resistance either from internal the organization or externally or it has some disadvantages you have to take care of them along your um, uh, way when you are going to do the changes so the force field analysis is um, a model built on the concept uh, uh, by uh, lewin according to the theory that Change is characterized, um, characterized as a state of equilibrium between driving forces. That means there is a forces with that changes or with this um, um, uh, solution, and there is another side of forces against it. So in this uh, tool, you see the equilibrium and how you can um, help you to balance between these two sides and try to reduce the resistance and improve the forces that from the side of uh, the changes. Um, the force field diagram, it is useful in balancing the power involved in uh, an issue or obstacle. Um, also identify the important players that will help you to see uh, who with the uh, idea that you are going to, um, or with the idea of the making the improvement or the solution that you are proposing, and who is against to it, uh, also identify the causes, uh, the possible causes and solution of the problem. So it will help you also um, um, for the solution that you are proposing. Also, there is um, uh, causes and effects of that solution in terms of the organization. So um, in both sides, plus and minus. So this will help you to look at them in, in the both sides so you can evaluate your solution carefully and also at the same time consider the, uh, the obstacles and constraints from uh, implementing this solution. Um, let's watch this video together and um, that will help also to give an idea how we construct the uh, or um, construct yeah the diagram for force field uh, analysis and then we will go back uh, with explaining the example that we have so let's watch the video Thanks. 
everybody. This is Eugene Lockton, Lecture in Computing at the National College of Ireland, and welcome to my series of short problem solving techniques videos. In video number 17, we're going to take a look at force field analysis. So first off, what is a force field analysis? Well, we use it to identify the forces in place that support or work against the solution of a problem so that the positives can be reinforced and the negatives eliminated or reduced. So it's primarily about identifying the positives and negatives of a situation that we find ourselves in when we want to improve or change something. So what does a force field analysis do? Well, first it presents the positives and negatives of a situation so that they are easily compared. Secondly, it forces people to think together about all the aspects of making the desired change a permanent one. Thirdly, it encourages people to agree about the relative priority of factors on each side of the balance sheet. You can see a, um, a draft of one here. And finally, it also encourages honest reflection on the real underlying roots of a problem and its solution. So how do we create a force field analysis? Well, it's primarily done using a diagram with lines and arrows. No special tools or software or equipment is required to do a force field analysis. You can do this on a whiteboard or a flip chart or with a piece of paper and your favorite pencil. The first thing we do is at the top of the chart, we state the problem. And sometimes that's quite difficult to do, but do this in, in a very short sentence and identify what the problem it is or the issue that you're trying to fix or change. And then the main part then is you draw a T and large black lines as I have done here, draw a T so that we can add information to our diagram. So this is the starting point for our force field analysis. Next, at the top right hand side of your flip chart or, or whiteboard or whatever you're using, describe the ideal state. So if this is a problem you are trying to resolve, put the solution up here. If this is a process that you are trying to improve, put the new status up on the right hand side. In other words, we want to be able to see where we are now and what we would like to get to, because we want to identify the forces that will help us get there and also the forces that are stopping us getting to the ideal state. Next, on our T, we list on the left-hand side all the driving forces that we can think of, and on the right-hand side, all the restraining forces that prevent us from reaching the ideal state. And then we brainstorm ideas. First, I brainstorm all the driving forces ideas, all the things that are positive, all the things that are good, that are helping us right now to get to the ideal state. We're not there yet, but what are the driving forces, the positives? On the right-hand side, you want to identify the negatives because these are the restraining forces that are pushing us away from the ideal state. So that's why the arrows are drawn in the directions that you see here. Sometimes in some types of force field analysis, you will see um, thicker arrows for stronger driving forces or longer arrows uh, and so on. But basically, we're going to stick to the type of arrow that you see here. So this is a template for any simple force field analysis. So let's take a look at an example. And here's a classic example involved in the problem statement is that you would like to improve a person's ability in public speaking. So our problem statement is improve public speaking. And the ideal state that we would like this person to reach would be that they would be able to, in public, speak confidently. So within our team or within a group or workshop sometimes works best for brainstorming, uh, we brainstorm all the driving forces and all the restraining forces. Now, there are lots of positives and negatives that might uh, help or prevent a person to speak confidently, but I'm just going to use a selection of examples here. So the driving forces, I'm identifying four. We could, a driving force for speaking company would, that somebody would be able to get an increased self-esteem. It would help their career. It would help them communicate ideas better, help others to change. And I'm sure you can think yourself of many, many more positives or driving forces that would help somebody speak confidently in the problem of improving their public speaking abilities. When you've done that, go back and do a, a brainstorming session on the restraining forces or the negative forces. And again, a selection of these might be things like uh, somebody has had a past embarrassment in when they were speaking publicly. They're afraid to make mistakes. They may actually forget what to say, or possibly they're worried about a lack of knowledge in the area that they're speaking about. And I'm sure, once again, you can think of many, many more negatives or restraining forces that push a person away from speaking confidently. So these are the forces that are driving us towards confident speaking and the forces driving us away. The negatives are restraining us from achieving the ideal state. What we do then is that we 
hone in or we concentrate on the individual items that have been selected. I'm just going to select one here to keep this video short and under one of the restraining courses is that uh, a person may forget what to say. So that's a restraining course preventing somebody from speaking conf confidently in a public speaking situation. But it is relatively straightforward to overcome. For example, you might use index cards uh, for somebody to write down notes so that they wouldn't forget what to say or use PowerPoint or bullet points or something like that to help somebody uh, get over the fear or the negative of forgetting what they might say. And I'm sure you can also think here uh, about other ways of overcoming some of these negatives or restraining forces on the right, or indeed enhancing the driving forces or the positives on the left hand side. So in a task like this, you can get many, many ideas to improve the driving forces and to eliminate or reduce the restraining forces. So that's a simple way of looking at force field analysis. Problem solving technique. There are many others covered in my new. So uh, that was for um, the video we have watched and explain how the force field analysis diagram works. And also here, there is an additional example with extra information, uh, how you start to uh, the force for changes or the force against the changes. Again, we, th we say that this is before you start proceeding to the improve and you start actually acting to improve uh, that um, uh, effect you have from the measure phase, um, we conduct this uh, uh, tool. For example, here we have, um, this is example extracted from uh, the textbook for how to increase the usage of purchase order in a pharma company. Um, the driving and restraining forces, the driving, usually the one with the change, so we put them as an arrow from the left side, and the restraining forces or the forces against the change, so we put them as an arrow from the right side. And the target, which is the uh, changes you would like to do, which is the inc in this example, increasing the usage of a purchase order by a 50%. And it would be better if you write it here in the middle, as it's shown here in the diagram. So that will appear uh, all the information together. And the team also um, related on the scale from one to five, and this is also new here, uh, it was not included in the video, and uh, I see it is very useful um, for every single force against the change or force with the change. You evaluate it from one to five. Where is five? It is very important, and one it is the least important to the changes that you are uh, going to conduct. So. This is the order how you do the force field analysis. You agree on the current problem or issue under investigation and the desired situation, which means the desired, and that's the changes that you are going to implement or conduct. List all forces driving changes towards the desired situation, which is this side, and list all forces resisting the changes. So it will be here uh, from this side and review all forces and validate their importance. Allocate a score to each of those forces using a numeric scale, uh, for example, five to one, you can, you can use your own. Um, just you need to have a le legend key, like for example here, one that's mean low and five for high, so person can uh, interpret those numbers. Um, chart the influences by listing the driving forces on the left, and restraining forces on the right. So always the driving forces on the left and the restraining on the right. Decide how to minimize or eliminate the restraining forces or increasing the driving forces 
and then you can agree on the action plan that you will be included in the improve phase. In this example, for example, the forces to change, uh, they have listed four against four uh, forces against the change, increasing the department efficiency, and usually that will have a force against it perceived as a timely uh, process, increasing ability to take vendor discounts, and that will have also a, a force against it, cost to improve PO system, reduce rework, training required, increasing centralized purchasing, and it is, uh, this is against it, that's too bureaucratic. Um, if you think about it, even when in, in the case of uh, uh, our current status, the students, when they are um, introduced to this um, uh, new platform called Khidmatik for academic advising, uh, they, there is a force for these changes. Um, some, they think that it is, um, they are not aware or they are not trained how to use it. And this is, could be force against the change. And if you think about it, uh, is to improve the infrastructure in the comp uh, in the university as the target. You will maybe if you can implement this in the case of the new academic advising platform. You can see it also it's applicable and similar somehow to this case. Um, they see it sometimes also it is um, uh, need more steps to conduct, to log in and then you raise the request it may take more time so all these can be forces against the changes whereas a forces with the changes it could be to uh, increase the um, uh, transparency in the um, um, academic advising process uh, improving the infrastructure um, using more technological tools than uh, forms and paperwork. Uh, those could be forces with the change. And then you put for every factor or for every force against or with the importance to the changes that you have. For example, here, uh, reducing the rework, it has a three, whereas increasing the ability to take vendor discount uh, or increasing department efficiency, it uh, has a higher uh, importance to the, uh, the changes you are uh, going to do. So we have here four out of five in terms of the forces for change. And here cost to improve the PO system because in this case, that's mean they are going to implement a new system. So they have to invest money to do that. So it has uh, also importance for because they need to uh, invest cost to uh, implement uh, the new system, which will um, uh, have some resistance in the other side because that will cost the company uh, money. Then you add all these force to changes uh, up and you add all the force with the changes uh, again and sum them up and you see the total here, it says it is 13 compared 11 against the change. This is just to give you an overview and, and, and top view, where is the forces with the change is higher than the resistance. And that's a plus sign, that's mean the, the factors uh, or the forces with the change is higher. Uh, and that's mean more uh, with these changes, but doesn't mean you stop here. You have to analyze the highest or all of them if you don't have too many of them, and you put action plan how you reduce the forces against change. For example, um, the training required, then you can put an action plan how training can be done in-house or um, how can be the training included with the cost of the uh, PO system uh, that you are going to, to purchase. Um, the same here, how can you improve or increase um, if the force with the changes were uh, low and you need to improve it, then you can think about actions or steps 
to uh, consider it when you are planning to use that in the improve phase. If you have decided, you will go with, for example, here, increasing the purchase order usage uh, by 50%. Maybe you come to this level and you think um, looking for another um, uh, improvement plan or another changes in the process, it could be better because that can be parallel with other um, um, improvement plans or other changes in the process or in the organization and you evaluate them individually using the same tool based on what you have collected from the measure phase so you can settle on at the end on one of them that has more uh, forces for changes um, against um, uh, the forces that uh, resisting for these changes uh, or you have applicable set of actions that can reduce the force against changes better in one uh, improvement plan compared to the other so all these can help you in an analysis to narrow down your scope if you have multiple um, or multiple uh, changes you can conduct in your project if, and if you would like to narrow it down uh, to one or two or multiple um, uh, based on your resources, this is one of the tools that help you to do that. So the driving forces here show a total of 13 against an overall score of 11 demonstrated by the restraining forces. As we say, this is not all. Then you have to analyze each one of them as we saw in the video and uh, evaluate each one, how you minimize or eliminate those restraining forces and how you increase the driving forces because if you have reduced this total uh, against it that's mean you have more with it or more with these changes so that was for uh, the force field analysis diagram uh, moving on to one of the other common tools that maybe you have covered it in other uh, courses like engineering management or any other uh, training workshop, um, the SWOT analysis. How the SWOT analysis placed in the analyze phase, how it is important and what is the usage of this um, tool in the analyze phase. Basically, before we move on and dive in, in the, the SWOT analysis and, in, and define it, which is well known for stands for the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats uh, that is um, um, analyzing your organization uh, competition position in relation to the, um, the, the other competitors. And again, to answer all the questions why we have written the analyze, basically to answer or to provide those four uh, um, elements here. It will help you to maximize the strengths and maximize the opportunities. Also, it will help you to minimize the weaknesses and minimize the threats you have in your organization for the problem you have that you investigated previously in the measure. Also, at the same time, maximize the weakness uh, minimize the weaknesses and maximize the opportunities and maximize the strengths and minimize the threats so minimizing the threats and uh, the weaknesses along with maximizing uh, maximizing the strengths and the opportunities those are the objective or why we have the SWOT analysis in the analyze phase at the end, we will come up with list of actions, how we can achieve the minimum level of weaknesses and threats in the organization by the changes you are going to provide, as well as max how you will maximize the opportunities and strengths in the organization by the changes you will provide in the improved phase. So this that's why we have it in the analyze phase or the analyze uh, stage. Uh, going now to the, the SWOT analysis, the SWOT analysis, um, um, each phase of them 
evaluate your position based on um, your current status comparing to the others. For example, let's start with the strength that stands for the S in the SWOT analysis. Um, things your company does it well, maybe if you are car maker, that means you are a well known that your car are reliable more uh, than others. Um, uh, qualities that separate you from your competitors. Internal resources such as skilled knowledgeable staff, for example, you go to um, um, uh, old organizations or old companies, they have staff that are very skilled and they have enough resources so they can stand against competitors that appear new in the market, comparing to a new uh, um, um, companies that they are just established. So this is one of the strengths you may have. Um, tangible assets such as intellectual property, that means you have um, uh, IP for many products that belong to your company. Um, capital property, technology you have, that is strengthening you against the others. Um, moving with the W, that stands for weaknesses, things your company lacks, maybe the things appeared here as a strength is maybe you don't have them, so consider to be as a weakness. For example, you don't have skilled knowledge staff, things your competitor, competitors do it better than you, especially if you think about um, something common like food industry. Um, uh, many uh, restaurants serve the same food. Um, if we have looked to a certain type or certain dish or certain cuisine, then competitors or competition is clearly come to this level. Other competitors, better, other people doing better than you in that um, dish or they serve it better than you. So um, this is considered to be weakness in your business. Resources limitation, for example, you don't have enough uh, capital, uh, or meaning money in your uh, resources, or you don't have enough uh, uh, laborers, and clear um, unique uh, selling uh, proportions. Um, you don't have um, a clear vision or clear um, idea about the selling uh, proportion in the market of your company. Opportunities underserved market for specific products. For example, there is products needed in the market that is not provided enough. So if you are going to enter this uh, business, that's going to be a large opportunity because you would be having the second one, which is few competitors in your area. So if you have decided to go, for example, um, um, I give you one example the, to do a car um, uh, fixing your car while you are home. So you have an application where you can request car fix in your location. So they will send someone to repair your car while you are at home. So this is an opportunity. Uh, I have seen that in, in one of um, car uh, dealer, authorized car dealer, they provide um, uh, oil change and all this um, a light um, frequent service or periodic service to your car that you can request it and comes to your home and they fix your home uh, fix your car while you are um, parking your uh, uh, car in the parking lot and that considered to be a strength if you have it and it can be opportunity if there are a few competitors who has done this so you, it's a chance for you to enter it and uh, provide it. So it will be opportunity for you if you don't have it or a strength if you have it and others competitors, they don't. Uh, emerging need for your products or services. So you can have um, more products or more services or you can emerge with other companies so you can increase your capital. This is, could be uh, opportunity and we saw that. We saw now recently many banks merged together, National Commercial Bank with Samba, uh, uh, Owl Bank with um, uh, SAB Bank, and that will open for them a large opportunity for um, increasing, increasing their uh, projects and 
investing or um, uh, uh, utilizing their uh, liquidity. Um, press media coverage for your company or your uh, product that you are selling. Some people they use, for example, uh, social media influencers. So they um, um, make marketing for their products. So people go and purchase your uh, product. Threats, it's against the opportunities. And here is where is the T comes from. Uh, Emerging competitors, and here we see it's opportunity you merge with others. Competitors, if they merge together, then that could be a threat to you because you will have a big well in, in, the, in the market and you are going to be small compared to them. As you can see now, those uh, supermarkets, um, they are um, um, coming in the, in the neighborhood Whereas the local small um, grocery stores, they cannot survive if they don't have um, studied their business well because they cannot be competing those um, uh, big supermarkets in terms of the price they are providing. Uh, changing uh, regulator environment. For example, now we have seen recently uh, the Ministry of Labor, Wazarat al Amal, and Minister of Interiors and Externals, Dakhli al Kharjiya, they have established many regulations and fees for uh, um, renewal, the visas for your labors, uh, the fees for your business um, uh, establishment. Uh, this could be a threat to you because you maybe have not included that in your plan if you have recently just opened your shop. Um, so these changes that happen, it could be a threat to you. Uh, navigate it, uh, negative press media coverage. Some people they maybe use that against to you, um, and that will ruin maybe your business. And we have seen many examples of that. Uh, changing customer attitudes toward your company. Um, customer attitude could be, for example, now um, uh, tax implementation. For example. It could change the customer attitude to certain products or certain uh, services um, and moving to others um, to re maybe to reduce uh, the cost or uh, to reduce their expenses. Um, so all that, it could be a threat to your uh, product or your company. And when you do in the analysis phase and you do uh, changes even in the process, you can evaluate how the company could be affected um, um, according or you're conducting the SWOT analysis for your company so you can tell if these opportunities or the threats there is a potential to conduct Six Sigma uh, a project or maybe conduct changes based on the Six Sigma that uh, phases you have implemented defined measure uh, to reduce uh, threats or reduce opportunities or maybe increase strengths. You have things you are good at and you want to improve it uh, so you can be leading uh, in that uh, field. Or also, um, uh, you can sorry, you increase opportunities by implementing um, what you have uh, found in the measure phase, or you reduce weaknesses that you have um, uh, found in your um, process in the organization. So it will not affect or it will uh, reduce the effect of the weakness um, based on the SWOT analysis. Let's take an example here and see how SWOT analysis, uh, it's been applied to a very well-known name in um, uh, car makers uh, uh, industry. So let's watch uh, the video. Great. In this video, we'll use the SWOT framework to analyze Tesla and organize our thoughts about the company. Hopefully a 360 degree analysis of its strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats will improve our idea about the firm's future outlook. Tesla was founded in 2003 and is on the mission to become the first successful pure electric vehicle producer in the world. Also, it aims to be one of two U.S. auto producers that have not filed for bankruptcy, the other one being Ford. Let's start with the company's strengths. First of all, 
Everyone has heard of Tesla, right? So it definitely has strong brand recognition. Actually, Tesla is the most recognized electric car producer in the world. Quite an advantage with respect to other companies that are about to enter the industry. Moreover, many customers appreciate Tesla's innovator's spirit and the fact that it is a first mover in the automotive industry. Such originality, coupled with aesthetically pleasing design and positive customer experience with the product, justify Tesla's premium pricing and choice of differentiated competitive strategy. Elon Musk, Tesla's notorious CEO and major shareholder, is one of the most famous and appealing businessmen around the world. His ability to tell a story and involve the public is unmatched. By doing this, he wins over many people who actively follow his businesses and will likely become customers. What is very important, such customers can be very loyal if handled correctly, which is priceless in the long run. Tesla is attractive to people because it doesn't simply sell cars. The company sells a story, the story of an organization which is in business with an ideal purpose, to preserve the global environment. Probably this is Tesla's most valuable strength. Along with that, we can mention several other important advantages the company has. Its cars are ahead of the competition in terms of battery range and experience with battery production and recharging. Tesla has put in motion a plan that would make it the biggest battery producer in the world. The company intends to construct several gigafactories, three in the US, one in Europe, and one in Shanghai resulting in a significant cost advantage against competitors who outsource battery production. Tesla's autopilot feature has been operational for several years now, accumulating more and more data and testing in real life conditions. In a future where we will increasingly depend on autonomous vehicles, Tesla's experience with autopilot would be extremely valuable. Of course, we also need to mention the company's supercharger network allowing Tesla owners to charge their vehicles for free in a very fast way when on the road. In a perfect world, this would do. However, we live in a fossil fuel dominated world. So let's consider Tesla's competitive weaknesses too. Number one, and quite important, Tesla continued to burn cash in 2017 and 2018. The company has not turned a profit ever since it was founded. That's understandable considering that it grew rapidly with the goal of becoming a true global auto producer. Plenty of investments were made to achieve that. Negative cash flows are a problem given that Tesla's stock price is under significant pressure from short sellers who believe the company is overvalued. The fact that Tesla isn't a traditional mass market car producer became obvious in late 2017 and 2018 when the company started producing Model 3. The automatic production line it had constructed did and Tesla was unable to target of 5,000 automobiles per week for about a year. This proves that it can be very hard to make the transition from being a premium sports car producer delivering several thousand cars per month to a mass market company. It is very likely that the company will experience similar challenges when it attempts to realize cost efficiencies and improve margins. Traditional car companies have the advantage that they have been in the business of producing at scale for decades. Tesla is an innovator in its field, but some may feel that Elon Musk's idea to make all of their patents open source was a bit naive and idealistic, endangering the company in the long run as it wouldn't be able to protect its inventions from imitation. The last weakness we'll add here is Elon Musk's divided attention. The fact that Tesla has a CEO who is responsible for four separate billion dollar entities is a bit disturbing. First, is he going to be able to sustain such workloads in the long run? And second, how much of Elon Musk's time is spent working on Tesla? Besides strengths and weaknesses, we should also consider future opportunities too, right? Let's go ahead and list some possible developments that could help the company succeed in the long run. 
the electric car market is the future of transportation. Most people agree on that. How fast will the transition to electric vehicles be? Most people disagree on that. Nobody knows. Some experts believe it will happen over the next 10 years. Others, especially the ones involved with petrol refineries, claim it would take at least 40 years. One thing is certain though, for Tesla, the faster the transition to electric vehicles, the better. Currently, the company is well positioned to win a significant market share of people switching to electric vehicles. In a favorable scenario, this could be great for Tesla as very few of the other automobile producers are ready to compete in the electric vehicles market at full scale. So that's definitely one opportunity. Another one is that Tesla expanded its product range. Remember, because of their merger with SolarCity, the company now offers batteries, power walls, and other equipment related to production and storage of renewable energy. A rising demand for renewable energy mean more business for Tesla. Furthermore, Tesla's huge industrial batteries will become a very interesting product line in the event the renewable energy market continues to grow at this pace. If it speeds up even further, the demand for storage of electricity produced by renewables will rise sharply. Of course, there are some very enticing opportunities ahead of the company in terms of economies of scale increasing volumes of production, and hence lowering the cost of production. Think Model 3, for example. Economies of scope, producing different types of vehicles will probably be more efficient when the range of products Tesla offers expands and R&D costs can be shared between different models. Another exciting opportunity is factory automation. Elon Musk shared that at some point, the production hell the company experienced was caused by too much automation and the level of automation of its Model 3 production line had to be reduced. That was a painful experience. But now that Tesla has the scar tissue and has learned a valuable lesson, it will probably try to build up on what was attempted before, removing flaws from the automation process. This could result in improved production volumes and lower costs, especially in terms of production personnel. Okay, great. One of the weaknesses we mentioned was that Elon Musk divides his time between several companies. Well, this can be a problem, but it also can be highly beneficial in the right circumstances. Elon Musk is involved with firms like SpaceX, the boring company, neurotechnology firm Neuralink, and nonprofit organization OpenAI. At some point, it is highly likely that synergies between these organizations could help Tesla improve its competitive position and know-how, providing a valuable advantage against traditional auto producers. The last piece of our SWOT analysis are the threats ahead of the company. As we mentioned before, the gradual transition to electric vehicles can happen in 10, but it can also happen in 40 or more years in a favorable scenario. Slower transition is a significant threat because it strips Tesla from its first mover advantage and puts it in a position to operate in a market that is not growing fast enough. Such a scenario isn't very likely, given that most research indicates the electric vehicles market is about to experience tremendous growth over the next several years. Of course, the entry of traditional producers is a significant threat, as we discussed. Firms like BMW, Volkswagen, and Daimler will undoubtedly enter the market. As Tesla continues to release new models, there is no guarantee production difficulties would not appear again. This is another threat. Finally, one has to consider tax incentives for electric vehicles that are allowed in the US and around the world. At the moment, governments subsidize electric vehicles through tax deductions and other similar incentives. In the U.S., for example, automakers are allowed to sell up to 200,000 subsidized vehicles at the maximum incentive rate of $7,500 per vehicle. Then incentives are halved to $3,750 per vehicle, and so on. Although people from the automotive industry have asked for these incentives to be kept intact, even after reaching the 200,000 threshold, U.S. politicians seem reluctant to do that. 
So discontinuing incentives for electric cars is another threat for an electric producer like Tesla. Okay, perfect. I believe this wraps up our extensive SWOT analysis in which we looked at Tesla's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Hope it was interesting. Okay, that was a good example and um, uh, informative and uh, good information also to expand your knowledge about SWOT analysis. Let's uh, move on to the another tool of analyze phase. Uh, pistol analysis, uh, again, similar to what we have um, experienced with the force field analysis diagram. The difference here is um, when you are going to provide a solution or you implement your uh, project, um, here it evaluate the solution that you may take it in the improved phase in a broad level, different than the force field analysis where it just focus on the um, uh, the forces with and the forces against. Here it has more of systematic and categories uh, that where you evaluate your solution uh, or your project or your changes based on. PESTEL analysis stands uh, or uh, the word PESTEL uh, stands for P for political, uh, E for economic, S for social, T for technical, um, L for uh, the legal, and the last one, E for environmental. The analysis is a tool for assessing the impact of the external context. Also, it could be used for internal context, which I will explain when we come to the example. Uh, on a project or a major operation, also the impact of the project on its er, uh, external uh, circumstances. So uh, it can work in both ways. So what is the impact of your changes or a project into those criterions that we will talk about them or how those criterions will impact on your project or changes you are going to provide. Uh, it is very useful. It is very um, maybe uh, a zoom out a view of the solution that you are going or the changes you are going uh, to make. Um, let's just go first and define those um, uh, terms. The political uh, a project is affected by the political, international, or national or local government. Uh, it's also influenced by company policies and those stakeholders, managers, employee, and trade uh, unions. So it can be not in the term or, or the level of the international or local government, it can be inside the company, like policy and procedure they have in the company, it could be the uh, political side. The economic is the project is affected by national or international economic issue, inflation, interest rate, and exchange rates. Also, you can think about it, the economic in the organization, their budget limitation, or also uh, taxes. Um, um, this is also can be considered as an economic. Social, the change is influenced by social issues, the local culture, uh, the lives uh, of employees, communication, and uh, language. Social, in organization or in a company, it could be also um, the uh, the team communication, the people are working inside the company. Um, uh, um, these consider to be the, the human part of the of the, uh, the the human resources you have in the company could be part of the social. Um, all these factors, local cultures and um, uh, communication languages 
this considered to be inapplicable for any type of projects or companies that you where you are going to implement your project. Technological, this is uh, absolutely that is um, one of the game changer this time. Um, so you have to consider it at any point where you think about changing um, and making modifications and improvements in the organization or process or a company because um, the rapid uh, changes in the technology uh, around the world. Uh, the success of implementation is affected by technology uh, of the industry and the technical capability of the parent company uh, that also uh, has to be evaluated. Uh, legal and uh, legal is the project affected by the legal aspect of planning, registration, and working practices. Um, uh, legal is a bit uh, different than the political. Uh, political more of the uh, policy procedures inside or internationally or even inside, as we said, the company. Legal is the things that um, uh, give you the ability um, to conduct um, uh, your solution without um, um, uh, contradicting with, um, 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 for example, the intellectual property of someone uh, or copyrights or something like that. Um, environmental, um, the environmental is the impact of change on environment emission, if we are talking about pollution, noise, health, also this considered to be environmental, safety, uh, this is considered to be envi environmental. Um, the pistol analysis, how it works, um, let's take here, the, the, let's watch the video here before we proceed with the example to, to give you an idea how is the pistol um, um, tool works and then we will come to this example. So let's watch uh, the video and come back. The pestle analysis. A pestle analysis is a framework that managers use to analyze their external environment when they are formulating the strategy for their company. Sometimes this analysis is called pest or steeple. These are just different terms for the same tool. A pestle analysis does not look at the company itself or its immediate surroundings, such as its competitors or suppliers. Instead, a pestle analysis considers the macro environment, those developments in the outside world that the company cannot influence, but that can have an important effect on the company and its strategy. You can picture the management of a company looking outside their office window into the wider world to see what important developments are taking place. When we do this, the PESTEL framework is useful to make sure that all relevant topics are taken into consideration. Political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental. When doing a PESTEL analysis, there are two important steps. Firstly, you identify relevant trends that are taking place in the external environment that can have an impact on the company. These trends should be happening now or in the near future. You can think of them as waves in the ocean that you can see coming. They have not hit the shore yet, but you know that soon they will. For each trend that is identified, management can then discuss the strategic implications and decide on the right action to take. Let's look at an example. Say you are running a coffee shop company. For political trends, there may be a trade war on the horizon between your country and others. Your coffee shop can be impacted by import tariffs on foreign coffee beans, which will increase your costs. As an action, you may want to source your coffee from other countries that are not subject to the import tariffs. Economic trends can include the anticipated growth of the economy, the level of inflation, or changes in the level of unemployment. All these can affect your business. Let's imagine that the economy is growing rapidly and is forecast to continue to do well. This can be a good time to expand your company and open new stores. For social trends, you may observe that people are getting more interested in healthy food. 
This can lead you to change your menu to accommodate the changing needs of your customers. In technological trends, we can see that internet access is becoming cheaper and faster and that people are spending more time online. This can encourage you to invest in fast Wi-Fi for your stores and to advertise your business on social media. For legal developments, there may be government announcements about changes in taxation, an increase in the minimum wage, or an upcoming requirement to disclose the number of calories on your menu. All of these developments will impact your business in different ways. Finally, an environmental trend that is important for nearly all companies today is climate change. In response, you may invest in solar energy on your rooftop and make sure that the coffee beans you purchase are grown in a way that does not damage the environment. Remember that the letters in the PESTLE acronym are only there as a reminder for you to make sure you are not leaving out anything important. It is not really critical where in the PESTLE analysis you place each trend. For example, the fact that people are spending more and more time online can be considered both a technological and a social trend. The important thing is to identify the main developments in the external environment and to think through the strategic implications for your business. That concludes the PESTLE analysis. Check our other videos for more insights. Brought to you by Sim Institute. Okay, um, that was a good video for a general overview and an example also about the PESTEL analysis. As we saw also that the acronym of PESTEL can be used for a PEST analysis. Um, um, the, the idea, even though it looks like um, more broad and it has to be in terms of um, uh, the international or environmental, that the external context also it can be applied to the internal context of your organization um, depending on your case um, we will talk about this example here first uh, this example uh, talking about the policy for renewal uh, management process of an insurance company uh, based in Finland the company implemented online service or online renewal service so you can log online to renew your uh, insurance policy and um, they have done that in Finland and they want to expand it to other uh, European Union countries. Um, the pistol analysis carried out as a showing that in the table here and um, it shows you the expansion of online service in general has a direct influence upon and opens also opportunity in the um, um, European Union. Um, the political part with this fa uh, this project has a key factor and here you identify the key factor for every um, element in the pistol analysis. Um, for the political part within the European Union's countries, they are moving towards more common political structure. So that's um, have an impact and you score the impact from zero to ten. Uh, whether it has a high impact on your uh, project or it has a low impact on your project. It has a, a good enough impact on your project even though it's not really high enough, but also because they are moving towards a common structure, that means they would adopt um, some practices or maybe best practices, so they may, uh, they may also adopt those uh, Finland uh, um, practice in terms of the renewal, pro, uh, online renewal process. For the economic, um, a slowing economy of Finland, uh, GDP forecast to grow by 3.9 in 2003. So it has also high impact. That's mean there is expectation the, um, uh, the economy will increase uh, in the company and that means it will be in, uh, impact positively on the project. Uh, the dynamic changes in the client business environment in Finland and Europe also that's considered part of the uh, economy. Um, social differences um, in buying habits in Finland versus 
uh, European uh, Union. Also, it's considered to be a moderate uh, impact on the project. The technological where it has the highest, as uh, we see the nature of this project, infrastructure based or technological based, that's why it has a high impact on the company uh, project. And you can tell that uh, for those reasons, accelerating the pace of change in the infrastructure technology in Finland, that also uh, the other reasons um, considered here to be has a high impact on the company. Uh, the legal um, new constraints or requirements initiated by uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory or regulations bodies, um, insurance supervisory authority in United uh, or uh, in uh, European Union, that's also lead to a high impact uh, on the project. Didn't have significant uh, in terms of the environmental impact. Um, that's why it has a low impact factor. Now, when you look at it, maybe you see it is really hard to be implemented in your case that you are working on, but all what is implemented here in terms of the um, high scale, because we are talking here about European Union countries and a high level of political um, uh, factors, um, uh, legal um, cases, you can implement it even in the company. So all what is implemented here or uh, demonstrated here can be applied internally inside the organization. So political policy and procedure related to the company, economic as we talk, the resources they have, um, uh, liquidity they have, uh, also the external economical factor is also considered to be applied to your company. So it could be a key factor. For example, turnover uh, project uh, people, turnover people from a company, that's mean many people leaving uh, and uh, the, the, the company or um, entering the company it could be due to economical uh, factors. So if you want to improve that or reduce that turnover, uh, one of the factors that's considered to be the internal economical factor in the company. Social, as we said, social, that's not only the, the external social uh, factor, also the internal social um, consideration and, and factors. Um, you want to improve, for example, uh, uh, working hours, considering that the social factor for um, having people working in light or uh, night shifts. So you have to consider their social life and social preferences. These type of things and thoughts can be also, as uh, what I'm trying to say, applied internally. It doesn't have to be at this high level. Uh, technological part, this is obviously can be done at any level from high to low in the company or outside the company. Legality or the legal here, even either inside the company, if they have legal policy, and we are not talking here about policy and procedure related to operations, we are talking about legal in terms of, as we say, the IP, intellectual property, or um, having advertisement uh, uh, of the, or in, uh, exposing information of the company or um, any other legal um, issue that could be affecting uh, your project or your pro uh, uh, proposal or changes that's considered inside or outside. Environmental, it doesn't have to be, again, related to the, uh, to the emission, uh, and pollution level, or it could be inside the environment, how to have a um, uh, work um, area environment more um, uh, productive uh, by having enough workspace, uh, enough uh, or a good facility layout to improve the environment in, inside the working area. So what we can conclude here, it doesn't have to be the fiscal analysis, all the time implemented at this high level, it can be to low level in the inside the organization, uh, including your uh, change in uh, or your um, improvement in a certain 
process in the pro uh, in the company. Moving uh, to another tool in the analyze phase and a statistical tool this time, which is the regression analysis. Regression analysis, I believe that has been covered in other uh, courses like statistics or design of experiments. Um, here we would recap about uh, regression and focus why is um, the regression could be the in the analyze phase. The regression, some they see it similar to the scatter diagram and everyone know what is the scatter diagram. Scatter diagram shows the relation between two variables by just drawing an X and Y uh, a chart, the dots that represent the, the, the relation or um, um, uh, the relationship between those two variables, let's say the obesity and um, the calories intake that you have. Uh, so um, as you increase definitely the, um, uh, the calories or the fat portion in your food as uh, the obesity level uh, could increase. And usually is the best fit for linear relationship that's uh, between two variables. But the scatter diagram doesn't give you um, um, the prediction of the causes and effect relationship. And that what does the regression analysis gives you. And that's why we need to focus here on the regression analysis because we are talking about cause and effect. And when we analyze our causes and effect that um, from the major phase and we would like to analyze them and we come up to um, two variables and we would like to see uh, the first, the relationship between them and how we can predict um, 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 uh, the, the cause and effect uh, relationship in the future uh, for those two variables. The regression analysis will help us here more than the scatter diagram. Um, it provides, uh, the, um, this is for the scatter diagram, it provides the basis for the prediction of a variable for a given value uh, of a process parameter. Um, the um, scatter diagram, the, on the other hand, does not predict the causes and effect relationship. We will see in a, in a, in a few, the, um, if uh, the variables are going to be changed by, let's say, um, by this amount for one variable, the scatter diagram does not tell you how much the other variable will be changed. So I can tell if this uh, two variables have a strong relation and also I can predict how much this, the other variable will be um, changed in order to focus on those two variables in my improve phase. And that's why we have it here in the analyze. If there is not only strong relation, but I can predict also uh, the value of the parameters from having one uh, of the other uh, parameters values, that will help me to identify what can we do in the improved phase for um, improving those two variables. How, how we conduct the um, regression analysis? We consider the um, linear equation that is known for the um, regression analysis, which is y equal mx plus c. The m, that's for the slope, and um, c is the intercept, the taqatu' wa al uh, X and Y are those variables that we are studying them in terms of the relationship and also to use them for prediction um, in the future. Uh, in the equation here, we substitute each of the pairs values for X and Y and then add the results of the equation. So we have um, the respond, which is we call it the Y and uh, X value from the historical data we collected. So we place them and have all the values placed and then we add the equations up as we will see in the example coming slide. Uh, from a second uh, similar set of equations by multiplying, so you form these equations again, but by multiplying through each of the equation uh, of step two here by the coefficient of the uh, slope m uh, and add these again set of equations then you solve uh, those two equations 
in terms of um, M and C, then you can straight line and um, um, have the equation ready to be used for a future prediction. Here is an example. Consider this uh, relationship between two uh, quantities, y and x, where is y values are given and the x values are given here. So you would like to study uh, the relationship between them. In the scatter diagram, all what you will have is those dots that shows you the relation between those two variables. But in the regression analysis, you will end up with an equation that you can have it and use it for predicting the value of y at any point of value or at any value of x and vice versa. So you can predict how are the values going to be changed. So that also will help you to uh, evaluate those two variables and analyze them. Um, following the steps we have uh, stated previously, you substitute the observed values here from the uh, given historical collections that you have done in the measure phase. For example, here 5 for y equal m plus c, m equal 1. So, um, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the coefficient here multiplied with 1, so uh, m plus c. And 8 will be for y, and the x will be equal to 2 times m plus c. So you applied all these equations, and at the end, you add them up. So you add all these values, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, so you end up with 10, and 1 plus 1 plus 1 and plus 1, then you will have 4 and you add all these values, you will get the 32. Then the next step, you multiply each of the equation by its coefficient. What is uh, the coefficient uh, of m? That's mean the value of m, you have it here, so you multiply the equation with it. So here we have the coefficient 1, so the same equation, no changes will be done. The coefficient here is 2, so you will multiply this equation with 2. 2 times 8 is 16, and 2 times 2 is 4, and 2 times 1 is 2. You apply all that along here, uh, and then you add all these equations again. Uh, in, the, in the last equation, this is the sum of all the coefficients, 1 plus 2, plus 3 plus 4 equal 10, and you add them all again. Then you solve these two equations for those two unknown m and c to get the value for m and c, as we have here m equal 1.6 and c equal 4. Then you can draw the line and write the relationship equation, which is y equal 1.6, which is the slope coefficient, uh, plus 4, which is uh, the intersect coefficient. Now you can use this equation to calculate the two pairs at any point you would like to. How we do this using uh, the mini tab? It is demonstrated here. We have the same data, y and x, from the previous uh, table that we have in the previous slide. You open the mini tab, you go to stat, then you go to regression, then fitted. Uh, line plot. When you press to that one, this box will open to you. So you select the response, which is Y. When you come to this, it will be blank. So we'll press on it. It will appear in this box, the columns where these information, you have them in the worksheet. So you double click on the Y and it will feed this field here. And you will double click here to feed uh, this field here for the predictor. And then you press OK, and then the graph will appear along with the uh, equation that is solved for you. And this all what you are looking for, that will help you to predict for the future pair values. And you can find the response for at any point where is the predicted values being changed. Also, the mini tab will give you, along with this plot, a model summary. And it is very useful to uh, interpret those uh, values. 
uh, the, uh, uh, starting with the most important here, which is the R square, and it shows you how close the data are to the fitted regression line, which is this line. So as much it gets close, as much as um, uh, the fitting is high, and that is good. So as it has more than 80%, let's say that's very good. And as much as gets more, as it's better. Uh, the S is the average distance that observed values fall from the regression line. So it is the average distance. So if we consider the average between each point from uh, the, the fitted line, um, so that will be consider the S and the R squared adjusted is the goodness uh, of fit for the regression model based on the number of independent variables. And since here we are using regression uh, for a linear and for only two variables, um, these um, are not going to be as important as the R squared to show the the fitness uh, or the fitted uh, level for um, uh, the regression line for those uh, points uh, for the data you have. Um, and uh, by that we can say this is a summary or a quick summary for the regression analysis that you can conduct to analyze your two variables. Moving to uh, our last uh, tool for today for the analyze phase which is the five whys. It is very simple tool and a systematic uh, way you do it. It's a systematic technique for asking five questions successfully. Um, the aim is to probe the causes of the problem and thus hopefully, hopefully to get the heart of the issue or the root of the issue. Um, uh, the five whys also widely used um, in the manufacturing and services. Also, it, it is widely used after you conduct the causes and effect, and you would like to start investigating those causes before you go with doing the Pareto or you doing the other um, uh, analyzing tool we have done here also in the, like uh, the interrelation diagram. Um, you use the five whys. It is similar, um, sometimes I see it like similar how you deal if you have maybe uh, you have kids in your family, they just keep asking you questions that is uh, uh, starting with why and you answer them then why. For example, I ask my son, okay, go to sleep early today. Okay, why have to sleep? Okay, because you have school tomorrow. Okay, why have to wake up early? Or you have to pray, why have to pray? And you have to eat, why have to eat? So all these five whys came from the concept of um, in, in coming to the root cause of the problem. Um, but there are some uh, steps you have to follow or some uh, remarks you have to consider when you conduct it. You select the problem and this is okay. And then you ask the five close questions one after another, starting with why, and this is okay. But here starting with point three, don't defend the answer or point finger or blame others. This is one of the rules you have to consider in the five why. Don't say because of that person, that mistake is happening. Because of that uh, department, uh, our sales is um, uh, decreased. So we are focusing on a process more than blaming others. Determine the root cause. Hopefully you come by the end doing and uh, having that. Um, this is an example of why, five why. Uh, considering a problem for delivery. Um, the delivery company or the shipping company, um, their problem is delivers are not completed by the end of the day at 4 p.m. So the first question, why, the common question, why does it happen? And the answer, the routing of trucks is not optimized. So they didn't say the truck uh, driver, uh, uh, his issue. So we don't blame, we start thinking about the process and the steps. They said the routing of the trucks is not optimized. Okay, why is not optimized? Goods are loaded based on their size rather than the location of the delivery. So why they are loaded by the size? The computer defines the dispatch based upon the principle of large items first. Why are large items given the preference? 
large items are delivered fares. Okay, this leads us to again, but why this happening? Current periodization policy puts the large items first on the delivery schedule. So we come to the end of the five whys, having that their system optimizing the, the, the process or scheduling the process for the delivery based on the large of the shipment, regardless of the locations. That's why they couldn't complete the delivery on time at the end of the day. And, and this is, uh, um, uh, remind me of uh, UPS when they have their um, right turn method concept in the delivery. Right turn method solved their problems, which is similar to this one, by routing or optimizing their routes by increasing the right, tra uh, right, tra um, sorry, right turns, <laughs> sorry about that, the right turns in the route. When you get to a traffic signal or traffic lights, um, the, tr uh, the, uh, the right turn is allowed. Straight and, uh, and, and left turns are not allowed until the traffic lights hits to green. So when you take a large um, uh, zone or a large area for the delivery, you increase the right turn in your route so your truck driver, he will not need to be stopping in truck, in, in truck lights uh, often. So the, this is how they got that concept. So they installed these maps in their software and uh, draw the, 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 um, the route for their locations based on that concept. Here in this example we have, they schedule it based or they periodize it based on the large items first. And that's why in this uh, scheduling process, they didn't consider how that can uh, maybe let the driver goes and turns here left and straight and go back to the same point where he started to uh, deliver another package. Um, this is an uh, example, a very simple example, and also it's a simple tool to be uh, implemented and useful in the analyze phase, which is the five whys. Um, by this level, or by this uh, tool, we can um, uh, complete our uh, session for today for the analyze tools. Again, not all the tools in the phases has to be all of them implemented based on your project, based on the resources, on the timeline you have, you choose the one that fits you. I hope that was beneficial session for you and see you in the next session in the improved.